As the year of 2021 comes to a close, it's time for me to rank my top 10 movies of the year. Now, this isn't some definitive list of the best movies of the year. This is simply my opinion and some of my favorite movies that I saw this year. Let's start from the bottom. Coming in at number 10 is 20th Century Studios' Free Guy. It is one of Fox's first films to continue production under Disney ownership, as well as under the studio's new name of 20th Century Studios. However, even having the disadvantage of being produced in the middle of a studio acquisition and getting its release delayed and delayed and delayed again due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this film still managed to bring something incredibly fresh and charming to the table with its humor thank you ryan reynolds beautiful design and cultural references this movie made an easy jump into being one of this year's best films number nine no time to die daniel craig has had some serious hit and misses during his 15-year tenure as ian fleming's 00 agent james bond but just because there was some shortcomings in the previous outings doesn't mean that Daniel Craig's 007 can't go out with a bang. From Kari Fukunaga's incredible sense of storytelling to the visceral world that the previous entries have already created, this movie proved not only to be one of the best movies of the year, but possibly one of the best Bond movies of all time. Number 8. Tick Tick Boom I knew nothing of Jonathan Larson, and I wasn't a huge fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda, if I'm being completely honest. Nothing against his talent, his music and art just never attracted me. But seeing Andrew Garfield give the performance of his life is what completely sold me on this film. The story was beautifully told by Manuel Miranda and made for a bold directorial debut. The story of Larson is all too real and hits home to me personally harder than it should. Aside from the impact that it had on me, this film was just well done. It had more heart than almost every other film on this list, and every performer, including crew, gave it their all, which is why this movie earns a top spot among this year's films. Number 7. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings If you are a fan of cinematic spectacle, Shang-Chi is for you. From the vibrant colors the world of Ta Lo and China have to offer, to the breathtaking choreography of the fight scenes. This movie screams blockbuster, but does so in such a tasteful way. This is an exciting introduction of not only Shang-Chi, but the Ten Rings, both the weapon and the organization. Destin Daniel Cretton gives us such a strong debut for a new Marvel hero injecting diverse DNA into the Avengers roster that doesn't feel forced at all. Oh, and it also has monsters and dragons, so that's always a plus. Number six, Ghostbusters Afterlife. What a shock, a very pleasant one at that. Jason Reitman takes the reins of his father's legacy in the most profound way by introducing a new generation of Ghostbusters while still respecting the originals. The organic way he brought the story together, fitting it into the originals, was a stroke of genius. While it may have the Force Awakens syndrome by essentially remaking the original film, it still feels like an original, fresh take on the property and gives new life, or should I say, afterlife to the franchise. I cheered watching the Ecto-1 drive down Main Street chasing a ghost, and I cried experiencing Egon get beautiful closure. To put it plainly, this movie was magical. Breaking into my top five of the year is none other than Spider-Man No Way Home. This movie completely changed how I look at movies, judge them, and ultimately impacted this list in a massive way. I've always looked at movies in two different ways, how well they were made and how much I enjoyed them. It doesn't matter if I love any given movie, if it wasn't made well in my personal opinion, it would never make any of my top lists. However, this movie is what turned my mind around on that front. Upon first viewing, I stated that this was probably the weakest of the Tom Holland trilogy because of the inconsistency with the rules of the multiverse, a lot of unanswered questions, plot holes, and just overall tonal issues. However, any problems that I've had with this movie are completely vanquished and overshadowed by the sheer fact that this movie exists. I've seen this movie five times and plan on seeing it again. And if a movie has me this head over heels for it, I don't see why I'd ever say it's not good because of quote unquote how it was made. Due to this change of heart, I decided to put movies like Ghostbusters Afterlife and Tick Tick Boom in my list, regardless of whether I think there were movies that were made better from a cinema standpoint this year. Anyway, isn't the point of a movie to make you feel? 
boy did I feel and feel a lot with Spider-Man No Way Home. Number four, A Quiet Place Part Two. John Krasinski delivered a powerful directorial effort into the horror genre when he made A Quiet Place, and a lot of people, including myself, thought, maybe he got lucky, maybe it was a fluke, a one-hit wonder. Then comes A Quiet Place Part Two, and the world was taken back. How did he manage to not only make another hit, but do it even better? A Quiet Place Part Two is a force to be reckoned with, and my only complaint about this perfect movie is that John Krasinski has stated that he's not going to do another, and this one ends on a cliffhanger. Seriously, who has John Krasinski's number? We need to talk ASAP. Let's get a social media campaign to make him and the studio make this movie. Speaking of social media influencing a studio into making a movie, this next one is the product of just that. Coming in at number three is Zack Snyder's magnum opus, Justice League. While I know the title of the film is prefaced by the director's name, I simply just like to call it Justice League because this was from the start Zack Snyder's original vision. This isn't a do-over, a reshot version of the 2017 theatrical release, or even an extended cut of it. This is the movie that Zack shot in 2016 and intended to release before the studio decided to step in and have the movie essentially remade, scrapping all of what Zack had already completed. This movie has scope. It's four hours, by the way. Scale. It's shot in a giant 4x3 format so that the image is incredibly tall, much like a comic book panel and a lot of heart. Watch Cyborg's origin sequence and tell me that there's no heart. There has yet to be another comic book movie of this magnitude, and I am not sure that there ever will be again. This is my most viewed movie of the year, and again, it's four hours, which is why this movie has a cozy number three spot for me this year. Number two, West Side Story. Steven Spielberg has never made a musical before, and the first time he does, he decides to remake one of the most iconic and greatest of all time. And on top of all that, he has the nerve to, wait for it, outdo the original. Yes, you heard me. Steven Spielberg has effortlessly told the tragic tale of West Side Story in a fresh and unique way, from withholding subtitles during any Spanish-speaking moments so that the English language wouldn't have power over Spanish, to the stunning, and I do mean stunning, visual language of this movie. There is no other director that can set up a shot as clear and concise as he does, yet still manage not to make them so individual that they don't merge perfectly with the others. This movie was like watching someone put together a puzzle perfectly from left to right with no time to waste looking for how any given piece was going to fit in with the rest. The weakest point of this movie for me was its lead actors. And that's not to say they were bad, they just weren't as strong as the rest of the cast. Ansel Elgort still managed to bring charm and charisma to Tony, while Rachel Zegler gave us a performance that will surely birth her into a star as Maria. And if that's the praise that I can give the weakest parts of the film, imagine how I feel about the rest of it. Once again, Steven Spielberg proves that he is truly one of the greatest of all time. And finally, my number one movie of 2021, Dune. Once every decade or so comes a movie that transcends cinema, a film that goes down in history as one of the most powerful and iconic of all time. I'm talking Gone with the Wind, Lawrence of Arabia, Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. These movies are pillars in cinema, and in 2021, Denis Villeneuve gave us one with his adaptation of Frank Herbert's classic sci-fi novel, Dune. From the casting, production design, cinematography, visual effects, and overall direction led by Villeneuve, this film is quite literally a masterpiece. Grand is the best way to describe it. I truly hope that they re-release this movie for anyone who didn't get the chance to experience it in theaters. It is a must-see, and to quote Zendaya's Chani from the film, this is only the beginning. That's right, the studio greenlit part two already, and I love that Villeneuve was bold enough to put in the beginning title card of this film, part one, telling audiences, the studio, and those who were involved in the making of this epic, the story that you are about to see is incomplete. And as incomplete as it is, it still somehow manages to send shockwaves through modern cinema. 
Denis Villeneuve already had proven that he was a force of nature, but this movie only sealed his title as one of today's greatest working directors, which is why this movie gets the top spot on my list for 2021. What was your top 10 of the year? Or top five? Hey, even just a favorite movie of the year? Let me know in the comments down below.